What is Candlemas? Who are Buckeye Chuck and Punk Satani Phil? What is President's Day? Whatever happened to Washington's birthday? And what did Esther Howland and Joyce Hall have to do with Won't You Be My Valentine? Answering those questions and more is what we'll work to unpack in this installment of the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming American Holidays series with JES scholar in residence, Dr. Andrew Roth. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spig and I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader an extension of his The American Tapestry Project. Uh, in American Holidays, Dr. Roth will explore how Americans tell their story through the people, places, and things that they celebrate. Um, American Holidays series examining uh, their history and origin, offering a window into the American story, examining America's most favored celebrations. Uh, future episodes are going to take a look at other holidays as we unpack them. We're going to look at how we celebrate freedom, ethnic holidays, state holidays, and other curiosities, sporting days, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The American Tapestry, the American Story, seen through the window of those things Americans celebrate. That's what we're here to do. We're gonna focus on some February holidays in this installment. Now you may recognize Dr. Roth from his book notes series published by the JES or his American Tapestry Project. That's both a radio program featured locally in Erie on WQLN Public Media and nationally on the NPR One app and is a JES digital programming series. Uh, in that programming series, you might recall that when I've introduced him in the past, I've noted his accomplished career in academia, uh, from lecturing to leading, as he's taught various courses before going on to serve in administrations in Erie and lead Notre Dame College in Cleveland as its president, before retiring and being named President Emeritus. Uh, breaking free from that tightening grip of retirement, Dr. Roth heeded the call to serve as the interim president of St. Bonaventure University. Now, seeing his vulnerability when it comes to maintaining a relationship with retirement, we at the Jefferson wrangled him in, where he's been serving as a scholar in residence ever since, offering numerous lectures, producing plenty of publications, and facilitating the Ramey Fellowship Program. For a fuller bio, please do head over to our website, jeserie.org. Now, folks, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, please still feel free to send us those questions to keep the conversation going. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, visit our website, jeserie.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Roth back to the JES digital stage. Dr. Roth, thanks for joining us here today on an actual holiday, Groundhog's Day. <laughs> it is. It's an actual holiday. It's Groundhog Day, and we're going to talk about Groundhog Day and Punxsutawney Phil and Buckeye Chuck and, and several of their colleagues. Uh, thank you for that fine introduction. Uh, you're too flattering. But in any event, uh, we're going to be talking about over the next, though, I think six or seven episodes across this entire calendar year, American holidays trying to discover, trying to discover uh, what Americans hold in common by examining the common objects of our love. Um, we can begin with a simple question. I think we did talk about this ever so briefly in uh, December when we looked at Twas the Night Before Christmas. How many holidays do Americans observe? I also noticed on the slide, I forgot to put a question mark at the end of that, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. Well, they observe 256 holidays from New Year's Day to New Year's Eve, from Stephen Foster Day to Wright Brothers Day, from Emancipation Day to Confederate holidays to Women's Equality Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, 64 religious holidays or days of observance, seven, and, and I only count seven major sporting events. Actually, there's probably hundreds of sporting events when we would take in local and regional, uh, high school and college, and uh, much less professional sports. Uh, paid, 13 paid federal holidays. We're going to look at how that all happened. Local holidays from Robert E. Lee's birthday to Rosa Parks Day. So Americans, um, Americans do a lot of celebrating, 256 recognized days. Uh, it's not from any particularly sophisticated source. I got that number by counting up and doing a little analysis of the, the holidays on timeanddate.com. The ones in, on your calendar come up automatically. Well, taking a look at some of those holidays, what are the big ones? And I suspect there's maybe only one or two, if any, surprises on this. I took this slide, uh, I took it from data 
provided by the Retail uh, Federation of America. And actually, the reason I repeated Christmas and Thanksgiving by reversing them a little is the Retail Federation includes back to school and first day of college, or of going back to college and first day of school. And uh, I'm not so sure those are holidays. But in any event, uh, I took them off and looked at our top 10. So Christmas and Thanksgiving dwarf everything. I mean, uh, I, I don't think that comes as a surprise to anyone. Christmas and Thanksgiving by a factor of almost five times in per capita spending dwarf Mother's Day and the, the, the next closest one, Valentine's Day, which is coming up. Uh, Groundhog Day doesn't make the list in terms of uh, consumer spending, but if you look at the big, big 10, you've got the, the two big ones, but Valentine's Day uh, still comes in at number four. Easter, Father's Day, Halloween has become an increasingly uh, more widely or more lavishly, I think is probably the word I'm looking for, observed day. Uh, once upon a time, it was simply trick or treating, and now you see people de decorating homes. And of course, the Fourth of July, and next month we'll be looking at St. Patrick's Day. The Super Bowl is an interesting one emerging in here. Uh, on on a per capita basis, Americans spend about eighty-eight dollars watching the Super Bowl. I am going to guess that's primarily uh, on food and beverages, uh, adult beverages. Uh, but those are the big ten. Uh, those fit, those 11 uh, paid federal holidays, well, they begin with New Year's Day, Martin Luther King's Day. Uh, they were created, and we're going to come back to this because the, the, this particular act had some interesting uh, ramifications that were probably not thought about at the time. They were created by the Uniform Holiday Act of 1968. It was passed on June 28, 1968. Uh, that's a year Jeffersonians, I think should be fairly familiar with by now. Uh, a lot happened that year, but it went into effect in 1971. And essentially it made three federal holidays, Washington's birthday, Memorial Day and Labor Day, uh, days that uh, used to follow a specific calendar day, Washington's birthday is February 22nd. Once upon a time, Memorial Day was always May 30th uh, and Labor Day is always the first, I think, first or second, first Monday in, in September, they became fixed as three-day weekend holidays. Columbus Day was not a federal holiday. It was made a federal holiday and created another uh, three-day weekend. Uh, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, they are not part of the three, nor is New Year's or New Year's Eve uh, part of that because obviously those, are, those dates are so fixed the, those celebrations are so fixed to specific dates, you couldn't just arbitrarily make them a, well, I guess you could, but you might get a lot of blowback if you tried to arbitrarily make them a Monday uh, to give another a weekend. Um, there, in addition to those federal holidays, there's, and this is just a small sampling, uh, a considerable number of state holidays and curiosity. I have Groundhog Day, uh, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. It is not a state holiday in Pennsylvania, at least in the sense that state employees in school get the day off and school is closed. Uh, and the state holidays range across some very interesting uh, contradictions. For example, in Texas, we have Confederate Heroes Day on January 19th. That's a, an interesting holiday. But on June 19th in several states, including Texas, we have Juneteenth celebrating uh, when Texas, as it turns out, was the last state um, to acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, evacuation Day goes back to the uh, Revolutionary War and the Siege of Boston when the British finally left Boston. And Elisha Peretrovich Day, I took that because I suspect most people, uh, most Jeffersonians have never heard of Elizabeth Peretrovich, but that is actually an official state holiday in Alaska. And she is the face of Alaskan Native civil rights. She was one of the main driving forces passing, ensuring the passing of the Territories Anti-Discrimination Act in 1945. So she is a, in Alaskan culture, she is a hero of freedom and equality. What month doesn't have a holiday, interestingly enough, of the 12 months? It turns out there is one month, although quickly I've got to add two caveats. It does not have an officially observed state or federal holiday in which offices close, et cetera, although uh, there are two sacred holidays in the month, Ashura and the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, uh, and one deeply banal 
uh, National Watermelon Day on August 3rd. But actually, August is uh, the only month that does not have a does not have a, a sanctioned holiday as such. So why holidays? What's interesting about holidays? Well, this is the outline of the series. Uh, and we started with a kind of preview looking at Clement Morris was the night before Christmas. Today, we're gonna to look at candle moths, groundhogs, chocolate and presidents. Next month, uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be aired on St. Patrick's Day. I think we're perhaps gonna probably pre-record that one. We're gonna look at ethnic holidays, a nation of immigrants celebrating their origins. We're gonna look at commercial holidays might strike people as strange, but I'm looking at commercial holidays as those that were essentially uh, if not invented, lavishly promoted uh, by various commercial interests, not the least of which would have been the American Florist Association, uh, such as Mother's Day, Father's Day, Secretary's Day, Executive Assistance Day, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Celebrating freedom, July 4th, uh, and a number of other holidays, back to those state holidays and curiosities, sporting holidays, and then Near the end of the year, we'll take a, a much more meaningful look at Thanksgiving and Christmas than we did uh, in that preview episode. So why are holidays important? Well, happy everything. Holidays are important because, well, they're important beyond just a kind of antiquarian or nostalgic interest in knowing where they came from and why we do what we do. Uh, and I would like, and, and Ben alluded to it, uh, there, th this series is a natural outgrowth of my earlier series on the American Tapestry Project, trying to discover what is the American story. And it occurred to me, one way of finding the common threads, the threads that hold the American story together and bind Americans, sometimes tightly, sometimes very loosely, uh, into a common culture, one way of finding that might be to look at the things they celebrate, uh, because the things they celebrate are the things they have in common. Uh, for example, I've made the point that on uh, St. Patrick's Day, everybody likes everybody. Well, maybe not everybody likes everybody, but almost everybody likes almost everybody. Uh, and if they don't have an Irish ancestor, they will at least uh, recall that one day they sat next to someone who was vaguely Irish on, on the bus uh, and therefore uh, will at least for the time of that one day claim some connection to the Irish. So I'm saying that ho American holidays are key components of the American story and they're key components of what makes us Americans and how we see ourselves and how we make sense and meaning of what it means to be American. And for any number of, of our viewers today, I, I know that many of you have seen some or all of the American Tapestry Project. So I'm gonna really kind of quickly go through the next couple of slides, reprising our basic theory so that uh, you will be refreshed. And if perchance there's new viewers, they'll understand what we mean by this. Um, Humans are meaning seekers. Humans are meaning makers. They want to understand why things happen. They want to understand how the world works and they want to understand where they, they fit in it. And how do they make this meaning? How, how do they establish that? Well, humans impose order upon their experience by telling stories. Uh, and uh, Joan Didion perhaps said it more memorably than anybody in the very first paragraph, actually the very first sentence of the very first paragraph of her classic study of 1968, the White Album, we tell ourselves stories to make sense of our experience. And the greatest stories answer three questions. They tell us where we came from, they tell us how we should live, and they tell us where we're going. When we're looking for the American story, we're looking for the story that tells us what are our origins? What, where did the idea of being an American come from? Given that, how as Americans should we live? And where as Americans is American culture going? And that leads to some interesting questions. What is the American story? Is there an American story? There are some people who say, no, there is no unifying story. And that, that's a problem. Or are there multiple American stories? Uh, some very noted historians would tell you that there is no one American story, but there are multiple American stories. Well, 
Neither of those answers to my mind are satisfactory because I'm afraid if there were only one story that might eliminate or exclude too many people. And if we say there are multiple American stories, then why should they hang together? Uh, because as I'm not quite sure, I'm having a, uh, a little bit of a memory lapse here, but it may have been Benjamin Franklin, who, but it was one of the founders who said, well, we'll either hang together or we'll hang separately, but if we lose, hang, we surely will. Well, if we have multiple stories, that's what's gonna happen to us. So why should there be an American story? Well, there needs to be an American story or at least some thread, some commonality that binds it together so that the center holds. American society, and this is no uh, news to anyone, has, is dividing, I suspect some people might say, has divided in the tribes and our politics has become symbolic. We don't really argue about tax cuts and regulating this or derate. I mean, we do in the background, but the major, the major political noise dominating the political arena is really what Richard Hofstadter and others have called symbolic politics. It's all about cultural issues. And how did that happen? How did our politics become about symbolic intangible issues? Well, it happened because we're no longer speaking the same language. We're no longer reading from the same book. We're no longer telling each other the same stories. And if we're to get past all of this, as President Biden said in his inaugural, quoting St. Augustine, we have to rediscover the common objects of our love. What are the things? St. Augustine um, in the city of God said that a people, as in the American people or the Irish people or the whomever, a people is a nation, is a multitude of rational beings united around the common objects of their love. A people is a multitude united around the common objects of their love. And in his inaugural address, President Biden remarked uh, that we need to not rediscover, but we need to reaffirm those common objects of our love so that we can understand that if this isn't an us against them, that we're all in this uh, together. Now, you have to be careful, of course, when giving unity uh, exhortations that they don't become fatuous and bland. But I think one of the things we'll discover, or I hope we'll discover, as we explore American holidays is we will discover some, maybe not all, of the common objects of our love. What are the things, what are the cultural things, what are the symbolic things that we value in common? And while we may argue over different policies and different uh, specific pieces of legislation, these are the foundational things that bind us together. So some questions to consider as we go through today's presentation and as we go through the series, what do we celebrate? Why do we celebrate what we celebrate? How do we celebrate? What does what we celebrate, why we celebrate and how we celebrate it tell us about the American story and who we are as Americans? That one, that, that fourth bullet point might in fact be the whole agenda. I could probably get rid of just about every other thing on this somewhat cluttered slide and just go with that one. So what are, what are the common objects of our love? Well, I think they come in three batches. The profound, America's core values, the American creed, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And most people I think are familiar with the, Amer the concept of the American creed. Uh, first coined by Gunnar Myrdal in the uh, 1940s. Uh, it, re it refers to the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That explores or that expands into something called the American civil religion, uh, oh, 100 and well, closing in now, 180 years ago, closing in on 150 years ago, Alexa, closing in on 200 years ago, excuse me, 170, 180 years ago, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America first talked about how uh, Americans, because of their First Amendment prohibiting the establishment of a state religion, really have used religion to infuse and enhance their civic virtues. And what are their civic virtues and their civic values? They're back to the American creed. Uh, and those two, the profound and the American civil religion, those two uh, intertwine. But also I think there's another one, the banal, what I call popular culture. A culture, as everyone knows, is the mosaic, 
the weave of customs, mores, values, attitudes, beliefs, the behavior of a group, the behaviors that a group of people hold in common. And popular culture is American culture, or American culture is pop culture. There's a high culture, but if all you know about American music is what you hear at the Philharmonic, if all you know about American, contemporary American music is Philip Glass, who, by the way, I happen to enjoy immensely. But if all you know is what you hear at the Philharmonic, then you don't know very much about America or American music. Because American music is pop music. There's no way around that. It, it, that's what American music is. In fact, some wise guy once said, I think it was not a wise guy, actually. I think it was Gerald Early who made the comment that a thousand years from now, when America is simply an item in history, the three things people will remember will be the Constitution of the United States, jazz music, and baseball. Not so sure about baseball anymore, but I get what he meant about the Constitution and jazz music. If all you know about American literature is David Foster Wallace and Thomas Pynchon, um, then you've missed the whole lot. So pop culture, I think, is important. And pop culture manifests itself in our holidays. So let's take a look at February's observances in which actually all three are present. The profound, the American civil religion, and certainly pop culture. The first observance, and it is today, February 2nd, uh, it actually precedes Groundhog Day. Some people might be surprised. It's an ancient holiday as Candlemas. And Candlemas, of course, is also known as the day of the purification of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and why do we celebrate Candlemas? We'll come back to that in a moment. But Candlemas also gave us Groundhog Day. Because, well, well, because, well, I'll tell you that in the next slide. And Valentine's Day. Those three are actually perhaps a bit of a stretch in one or two instances, but those three are actually very much interrelated uh, in how they all came about. Uh, President's Day, of course, is uniquely an American holiday. And talking about pop culture, it's number seven in terms of American capital spending, the Super Bowl. So what do these relig what are these observ what do these holidays have in common? What, from this from the profound President's Day in terms of American civil religion, Candlemas in terms of a Christian holiday, now perhaps not as widely observed, if observed at all. Uh, and that's an interesting dynamic that we could talk about. And then in pop culture, pop, pop, Groundhog Day and Valentine's Day. Well, let's take a look at, at these holidays. Groundhog Day. Why Groundhog Day? February 2nd, 1887, the first Groundhog Day in America. It was in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Clymer Frias, he was the editor of the local newspaper, was trying to figure out how to get people from Pittsburgh to pay attention to Punxsutawney. And he hit upon the idea of having a groundhog forecast the weather. He founded a group called the Groundhog Club. They got together at a little uh, clubhouse at Gobbler's Knob. And every February 2nd, they'd get Punxsutawney Phil to protect the, to protect, uh, excuse me, to predict the weather. Why Pennsylvania? Well, this goes back to Candlemas. 18th and 19th century German immigrants brought with them a tradition celebrating Candlemas in Germany. The, the custom had evolved that if a badger or a hedgehog saw his shadow on Candlemas Day, there would be 40 more days of wintry snow. But if it was overcast and he didn't, there would be an early spring. They brought that custom, and I've been doing the research on this. How that happened, I will, I'm all ears if somebody can give me the history of, of how that tradition began in Germany. But in any event, 18th and 19th century German immigrants brought it to America. Clymer Fries uh, brought it to Pennsylvania in particular, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Clymer Fries turned it into a state holiday a state holiday or a state observance and it became a national holiday. Interesting question is how accurate is Phil in his predictions? Turns out according to some data I discovered not really very accurate at all. He gets it right about 40% of the time. 
Staten Island Chuck, for example, gets it right about 70% of the time. Which leads me to this question. Now, how many of our listeners today realize there are other groundhogs that Punxsutawney Phil might have been first, but he is not alone? Well, we got in Nova Scotia, we've got Shubin Kanadi Sam in Staten Island. Uh, this is a somewhat uh, disconcerted looking Mayor Bloomberg holding Staten Island Chuck. Actually, uh, Staten Island Chuck bit Mayor Bloomberg one Groundhog Day. Up here in the corner behind Ben and I's picture, we have uh, General Beauregard Lee in Atlanta, Georgia, who lives in the lap of luxury in a plantation house. Uh, down here in the left-hand corner, we've got Buckeye Chuck from our neighboring state of Ohio. The University of Dallas adopted the Groundhog and Groundhog Day as their student activities day. It's the day they would shut down and have their uh, big campus-wide festival. Uh, and of course, they call the groundhog God's most noble creature. Then we have Weirton Willie, uh, who is from, you'll notice the spelling, Weirton, Canada, not Weirton, West Virginia. He's the albino groundhog. And Dick Goddard, a weatherman over in Cleveland, uh, who actually lived in Vermilion. Vermilion is a small town on the extreme west side. Well, it's actually not in Cuyahoga County, but on the extreme west side of, of Cleveland. Uh, he created a fall version of Groundhog Day, Woolly Bear Sunday, October 6th, in which we'll have a harsh or mild winter, depending upon the thickness of the coat of the woolly bear caterpillar, one of which that is not a real, ca a caterpillar that big would be a, a frightful thing to see. That is a, some kind of stuffed rag. So there are other groundhogs, but why February 2nd? Well, February 2nd is important for a number of reasons. And so I don't miss, uh, misspeak on a couple of things here. One, it turns out to be in pagan cultures, a very, very important date. It is exactly the midpoint date between the winter solstice and the vernal equinox. Now, descending into a wee bit of pedantry, one of the things that's always bugged me is when people say, March 21st or 2nd is the first day of spring. No, it's not the first day of spring. It's the apex of spring. June 21st is not the first day of summer. It's the apex of summer. Shakespeare understood that because that's why he wrote A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was midsummer. The actual seasons, well, and there is no hard, obvious thing. Nobody flips a switch and one day it's winter and the next day it's spring. But the actual seasons begin six weeks before that date. And it's an extremely important fact to know if you live in an agricultural or agrarian society, particularly if you live in, ag in an agricultural or agrarian society in northern climes. Because by the time you get to late January, the food you've stored from the previous summer and fall is beginning to be exhausted. And you need to know when you can begin to actually prepare to plant again. And so trying to figure that out in early calendars was critical, but it also became a religious feast day. For example, the ancient Celts on February 1st and 2nd, they didn't have February, that's a late calendar, but roughly at that time, they celebrated Imbolc, I-M-B-O-L-C. And Imbolc was a celebration of the ancient Celtic pagan goddess Brigid, who was, the, who was said to have been born with a flame in her head. She is the goddess of fertility, of life, of renewal. To the ancient Celts, this day was important because it was the day that began the signal the return of life. In Christian cultures, well, actually, it predates Christian cultures. In Jewish cultures, in Christian culture, in the Judeo Christian tradition, February 2nd is also the 40th day of Epiphany. It's the 40th day after Christmas, and it is the official end of the Christmas season. 
Why did they pick that day? We'd have to get back into some serious church history. But in Jewish culture, a woman who had given birth had to come to the temple to be blessed and cleansed before she could resume relations with her husband 40 days after the birth of a child. Now, I may have oversimplified that. And so if there's someone in the audience who knows more, please feel free to make my comments more precise, but that's the basic thing. So you have on February 2nd in Christian religions, it's called the presentation of the Virgin Mary. Uh, at when Virgin Mary brought the child Jesus to be presented at the temple, but also when the Virgin Mary came to be purified. It is also in Christian tradition, the day in which people would bring candles to the church to be blessed because Jesus was the light of the world. The candles were the light of life. And of course, one of the things we discover both in the pagan cultures and in other in, 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 say, in our culture is fire and light is the symbol of life. And one of the things we discover as we look into Candle Moss and Imbolc and Bridget is how did this in the Christian West become a separate holiday? Well, it became a separate holiday because of what I call the Christianization of pagan religions, of pagan holidays. We saw it with Christmas in the Saturnalia. You see it with Eostra and Easter. And you see it with Candlemas, not the groundhog, but you see it with Candlemas Day uh, supplanting pagan fertility rituals with renewal and purification and festivals of the lights. And this is, by the way, uh, uh, an image, it's not known if she even actually really existed, of St. Bridget, B-R-I-D-G-E-T, who is one of the patron saints of Ireland. And she is the Christian successor or the Christian replacement, however you want to phrase it, for the pagan goddess Bridget, the goddess of fertility, life, and renewal. And you see all three of those things here, uh, Candlemas which is the feast of the presentation of Jesus Christ, the feast of the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the feast of the Holy Encounter, and the feast of, the, uh, of lights. Uh, this is the presentation of Jesus at the temple, and the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary is also called Candlemas. Now, as we said, Groundhog Day and Candlemas always occurred on the fir February 1st or 2nd, Groundhog Day supplanted that, didn't supplant that, but was an offshoot of that in German culture, Groundhog Day comes to America. But there's an interesting thing, the pattern of Candlemas being, its roots being in pagan uh, celebrations is also directly related to what happens in Valentine's Day. It's not related to, but very similar to what happens in Valentine's Day. Because Valentine's Day, which is, let's face it, even bigger than the Super Bowl. It's the biggest holiday in February. It's the holiday that everyone just about has some involvement with and interaction and celebration of. Uh, might be a shock to Roger Goodell and some people, but not, not everybody is an NFL fan. A lot of people are NFL fans, but not everybody. But just about everybody likes Valentine's Day uh, for one reason or another, if it's only chocolate. So what's Valentine's Day? Where'd that come from? Now, why is it in February? And how did, what has it got to do with February 2nd and Candlemas and all of that? Well, first, a couple of notes on now. Valentine's Day is a big deal. Uh, every year, something like $19.6 billion is spent on it. 36 million heart-shaped boxes of chocolate will be sold. The average man spends about $130. The average woman, about $70. Teachers get the most cards. One billion Valentine's cards will be sent. Uh, it's the second biggest card day. Christmas is the biggest card day. Teachers get the most cards, uh, followed by kids, wives, mothers, and lovers. And something on the order of 3.3 billion will be spent on flowers. And that's an interesting statistic in and of itself, because remember, it is February 14th. Nobody went outside. Well, depending on where you live, no one goes outside and picked those flowers. What's the origins of Valentine's Day? I've made some allusions that it has some something similar in its background to Candlemas. Well, its origins, and it's debatable, go back to a Roman fertility ritual that was celebrated on 
February 14th, called the Lupercalia. And the Lupercalia uh, was a, interestingly enough, we're back to fertility, the beginning of the end of the winter season, the beginning of the growing season, the renewal of life. It was a celebration or a ceremony celebrated at the forum in which naked men, and you had to be an aristocrat uh, to be a February tour. Uh, this would be a February tour and the February is the whip uh, with which naked men, it was a great honor to be chosen, uh, would chase women about the forum and well, I don't know, not whip them, but touch them with the February the purifying lash that would do two things. Back to candle moths and the purification of the woman who had to go to the temple before she could resume relations and therefore be fertile again. It would purify the woman and enhance her fertility. Shakespeare has a comment about it in Julius Caesar. There's a scene in Julius Caesar when Caesar tells Mark Antony uh, to remember to touch Calpurnia when he makes his, uh, when he does his lap uh, for the ancients say it would, would relieve her barrenness. Well, when we get a little further on uh, with the Christian conversion, sometime in the fifth century, I think it's 496, but sometime in then, uh, there, the Christians had, uh, after Constantine, a uh, hundred years before, uh, had made Christianity the uh, official religion of the Roman Empire. A uh, hundred and some years later, in the late fifth century, circa 490, there was a, a plague and a, and a famine in Rome, and there was a, a revival of the Lupercalian festival. And in order to thwart that or suppress that festival, Pope Gelasius, uh, this is an image of him, who knows if it actually looks like him, but this is an image of Pope Gelasius. Pope Gelasius decreed that February 14th would be known as St. Valentine's Day in honor of two martyrs. Uh, the one my cursor's on is Valentine of Rome, the other is Valentine of Turney. Both of them, interestingly enough, have a connection with lovers. Uh, Valentine of Rome was executed because he taught the daughter of the general he, adopt, he, he converted her to Christianity. Uh, and allegedly, he wrote her a letter uh, the night before his execution, telling her she would be forever loved by God and that she was his Valentine. Who, who knows? Uh, I'm highly skeptical about that, but that's the legend. Valentine of Turney was identified with the Greek goddess of erotic love, Eros, and his stone, uh, on his bishop's or cardinal's ring was amethyst. And amethyst, of course, is uh, associated with uh, the gem of love. Well, that's how you get Valentine's Day taking over Lupercalia. So, you know, much like Candlemas, in bulk, et cetera, we have the Christianization of a pagan fertility ritual. And of course, they're all at the very earliest times at the beginning of spring. And whether it's February 2nd, which gets or February 14th, the point here is you're at the end of the winter season and the beginning of the spring season. And in agricultural societies, that was huge. We don't hear much about this uh, for a thousand years. I love it when you do this, some ancient history, you just toss out a thousand years, but a thousand years goes by. And in Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls, we first find the connection of St. Valentine with love. And it's in his poem, uh, the Parliament of Fowls, which uh, was written to honor the first anniversary of the engagement of 15-year-old Richard II to 15-year-old Anne of Bohemia. And the conceit in the poem is that every year on Valentine's Day, February 14th, the birds return uh, and have a parliament, a meeting. The bird, and as the birds return in northern climes, you start looking out your window for a robin or a, a wren, it would have been in England, a robin and a wren are the same thing. Uh, you're looking for the, the birds return. And when they return, the first thing they do is they pair off. And so they have a parliament, they meet in which they choose their partners. And as Chaucer says, for this was on St. Valentine's day when every bird cometh there to choose his mate. You know well how St. Valentine's Day, you come for to choose and find your way, your mate. St. Valentine, that are fully on lofty, the singing small falls for thy sake. So that's the very first time 
And it's interesting because it's a poem written in celebration of the marriage of a 15 year old to a fifth of the engagement of a 15 year old to a 15 year old. Well, in aristocratic circles, marriage was a political and economic arrangement. It had nothing to do with love. It may or may not have had something to do with eroticism, but it had nothing necessarily to do with love. Now, perhaps there were happy arranged marriages, partners learned to adapt and uh, cherish one another. But there also appeared in Chaucer's time, the notion or the concept of courtly love. Uh, I'm, on, I'm not gonna go into it at great length, but courtly love was a whole school as you know, uh, the Provençal poets um, in Aquitaine uh, were the ones who invented this or who were given the credit for it, Andreas Capellanus and others. And the whole notion was quite frankly, it's a rationale for adultery. That if in an arranged marriage and it was reserved, courtly love is reserved only to the aristocratic elite. The common, the hoi polloi could not participate in this rarefied uh, love. And it created the whole notion of what we moderns think of as romantic love. That is really a creation of the late uh, Middle Ages. And it contrasts romantic love versus agape, selfless love, uh, unconditional love, and domestic love. Uh, and it's essentially a rationalization for adultery. And that gets linked explicitly with Valentine's Day because it was on Valentine's Day that the poems were written, the songs were sung, the, the, the missives, not cards yet, or a couple of hundred years ahead of cards, uh, began to be exchanged. And these are all images from medieval uh, courtly love. But very early on, you begin to see expressions of Valentine's Day in the 15th century. Uh, the French translates basically as, I am already sick of love, my very gentle Valentine. So that the word Valentine has begun to change its meaning. It doesn't refer to those two saints, who by the way, may or may not have ever existed. The Roman Catholic Church dropped them from the role of saints because they have no uh, interestingly enough, in 1968, I think a hell of a lot of things happened in 1968. Uh, but forget, uh, regardless of the date, because they had no proof they ever existed. But you now see the word Valentine explicitly used not to refer to a saint, but to refer to the object of one's love, or a Valentine is your lover. Uh, in English, Marjorie Bruce to John Parston, my right well beloved Valentine. Uh, Spencer has it in the uh, Fairy Queen. She bathed with roses red and violets blue. And of course, the, the doggerel poem, now we're getting down closer to the modern world, the 18th century, com comes from a, an English book of children's poems, Gammer Girton's Garland. The Rose is red, the violets blue, the honey sweet, and so are you. Thou art my love, and I am thine. I drew thee to my valentine. The lot was cast, and then I drew, and fortune said it should be you. Now, that lot is important because it, back to the birds meeting in Charlotte and Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls, the way one drew one's mate was they drew lots. Uh, I could fast forward that to the late 20th century, and uh, not that I know anything about this except having read about it, uh, but the notion of people getting together and throwing their hotel room key into the middle of the room and whoever got, whoever got. Well, they might've thought they were being very avant-garde, very sheesh, sheesh, and very, very cool, but they were just doing an ancient custom. <laughs> they were just doing a modern version of an ancient custom. But keep that line in mind about a lot. Well, from Chaucer on Valentine's Day, you go through a transition era. By the time you get to Ben Johnson in the 17th century, he's already lamenting the fact that the Christian celebration of Valentine's Day has been debauched. Um, in his The Tale of the Tub, he says, let us example the deeds of charity to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the weak and sick, to entertain the poor and give the dead a Christian funeral. These were the works of piety he did practice and bade us to imitate not look for lovers or handsome images to please our senses. So already by the time you get to the Renaissance, Valentine's Day has ceased to be, well, it ceased to be a Lupercalian pagan festival. It ceased to be a Christian festival and it's become 
a ritual uh, of romantic and erotic love. So actually it does have some connections back to the Lupercalia, if you will. Uh, and I mentioned drawing lots. It was the custom amongst the, the peasantry every Valentine's Day to have, have a spring festival in which they would draw lots and pair off and spend a couple of nights in tents uh, reveling with one another. Uh, I always, when I do the longer talk on Valentine's Day to, to get a sense of exactly what was going on, I think spring break, that would probably be the, 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 the right mental frame of mind. Uh, by the time we get into the Renaissance though, and it's kind of a, a debauched or, or now a kind of decadent version of courtly love, you have the whole notion of uh, romance and romantic novels and grand operatic lovers as in this scene. And of course, by this time, you also have the guy with the gaze checking the woman out. Uh, and by, by the way, the hoop skirts were intentionally designed as a piece of uh, clothing to keep men away. I'm not sure how many people knew that. that. Uh, that's exactly why that is designed that way. Uh, and so that's, that's all there. And more importantly, for how the holiday develops, by the time you get to the high Renaissance, the major gift giving day, ceremonies of consumption, some called them in European cultures was Valentine's Day, not Christmas Day. Christmas Day was a minor day, not in fact, rarely celebrated as such. Uh, to a certain extent, New Year's Day, maybe 12th night for gift giving days, but the big gift giving day was Valentine's Day and Samuel Pepys in his diary has a passage in which he brags about the size of the turkey stone. A turkey stone is a stone in a kind of distorted oval, that an oval that comes to a point. That is a turkey stone, uh, a gem set, a gem setting. Uh, he talks about the, the great gift he had given his uh, wife on this Valentine's Day and she's gonna bankrupt him if she keeps expecting these gifts. And by the time you get to the late 18th century, you have the rise of sentimentalism in which Jane Austen domesticates Valentine's Day and tames it. And it becomes a holiday for the common person, uh, for, the, for the emerging middle class. It's been domesticated. And you begin to see what something similar to modern Valentine's Day cards. These are late 19th, early 20th century Valentine's Day cards. Uh, but the great innovation occurred in 19th century Britain in 1840, when uh, Sir Rowland Hill and the Postal Reform Act invented the first postage stamp, the penny black. And that is an example of the penny black. And that created the ability to send what we would call a postcard. And that created the whole craze of sending Valentine cards. So Valentine goes from meaning a saint to meaning a lover to meaning actually a commercial commodity, the card. Uh, in 1835, 60,000 Valentines were sent. In 1841, the year after the penny post, uh, 400,000 uh, increased by a factor of seven. And by 1871, 1.2 million. That led to the invention of the Valentine card business. Uh, and this is an image from Jonathan King, a North London stationer, what Charles Dickens called Cupid's Manufactory. You were making missives of love. And here are some examples of 19th century uh, balance, very ornate, very elegant. Uh, this one says, I am lost in admiration as I gaze upon thy graceful form for beauty glows in thy fair face and all thy movements charm. They jumped to America uh, in 1841. There was a report of a general mania for Valentine's at Yale. And as I said, as I just pointed out, uh, the changing of the word Valentine from Saint to lover, to commodity, a card. And of course, the American Valentine was invented by Esther Howland. She's the mother of the American Valentine. Uh, her father owned a large stationery shop in Worcester, Massachusetts. She's one of the first graduates of uh, Mount Holyoke College. Uh, her father and brother with their uh, stationery shop uh, selling uh, books, et cetera. Uh, one of the salesmen uh, brought Esther a card 
And Esther looked at this Valentine card and it's probably not the reaction the guy was thinking. She said, I can do better than this. This is, this is nothing. And she went home and she created the modern American Valentine, started a business on the third floor in the attic of her parents' home. Eventually she had her own Cupid manufactory in a, in a factory downtown as they churned out thousands, tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands of handmade. You'll notice these are all, there's no assembly line. This is craft work. All these women meticulously making these very elaborate, very ornate uh, Howland Valentines, the largest collections actually at the Hallmark Museum in Kansas City. Um, and any one of these, a genuine Holland Valentine would probably get you right to the front of uh, the line at Antiques Roadshow and you would be on the air. Uh, I'm not gonna say how valuable it might or might not be, uh, but it would certainly be a showstopper if you showed up with a Howland Valentine. Uh, other examples were cards, back to the penny post, that could be mildly suggestive. There were vinegar Valentines, the, uh, the wife who had a corkscrew mouth and uh, to my Valentine, tis a lemon I hand you, uh, the henpecked husband. Uh, obviously this guy didn't say the right thing because she's throwing cold water on him. Uh, there were also racy Valentines. Uh, I assume people can read the thing. I just uh, parking permitted by, uh, uh, permitted evenings by appointment, uh, the way to kiss. These are actual Valentine cards. Uh, and then this one, uh, and unfortunately Ben and I uh, are obscuring it because behind Ben, it says, you can go as far as you like with me. So that that's a fairly explicit uh, double entendre. It also was in America in the 19th century, the great gift giving holiday. And it created an entire industry of commercial gift giving and the retail industry of clothing and notions. It also had the interesting impact of changing shopping patterns. Prior to the rise in the 1840s and 1850s of Valentine's and shopping, shopping was a man's world as this picture of a early 19th century uh, store would indicate. But by the middle, late 19th century, it was something women could do. And that is a byproduct of Valentine's as a gift giving day. And these are some 19th century Valentine's. This is called a puzzle, uh, a puzzle purse. It's a Valentine that folds down upon itself. If you want to know how to make a puzzle purse, go to MarthaStewart.com. She has step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, the most common gifts would, of course, have been jewelry for women or elaborate but scars for men, they would have been pocket watchers. Now that question about chocolates, why do we have chocolates on Valentine's Day? Well, we have chocolates on Valentine's Day because Richard Cadbury of Cadbury Chocolates in England in 1868 began to sell heart-shaped boxes of chocolates. But why would chocolates, why would he have thought chocolates was something to do on Valentine's Day? And that's because chocolate has long been associated uh, with eroticism. Madame du Barry used to lace, cho her, lace chocolate with amber and give it to her lovers uh, to enhance, how shall I say this, to enhance their performance. It was looked upon as an aphrodisiac. And one of the great scenes in American film and from, from uh, the 1930s screwball comedy, uh, Dinner at Eight, Gene Harlow sits in a lavish bed eating chocolates in a highly suggestive way. So chocolates and Valentine's Day, it's because chocolate was considered, I suspect still is considered, not sure how effective it is, an aphrodisiac, Madame du Barry practiced it, and Richard Cadbury connected it to Valentine's Day, and now millions upon millions of boxes heart-shaped boxes of chocolates are sold. Hershey Kisses, by the way, are called Hershey Kisses. This would be another question you could win at Trivia Night at the Plymouth Tavern. They're called Kisses because the machine that made them as they dropped them had a hiss that sound like a kiss. And that's where the word came from. Uh, in American lore, Joyce Hall, who was an itinerant salesman, saw an opportunity saw what uh, Esther Howland and others were doing in the late 19th century. He created the greeting card business. He created Hall as in Hall Mark, uh, the mark of excellence. Uh, uh, and as he said, 
It's the sentiment that counts when you care enough to send the very best. And these are some examples of Hallmark cards. So that's Valentine's Day. A very, very quick history of it and how we get from an ancient Roman fertility ritual to a kind of holiday that is multifaceted. It has some erotic fertility overtones, but it's mostly just a feel good romantic holiday that actually encompasses the entire family. President's Day is a little more complicated. Uh, President's Day, of course, is a uniquely American holiday. Uh, it was created by that Uniform Holiday Act of 1968. It is still technically, the name is Washington's birthday. And it celebrates American patriotism. Uh, it celebrates Americans, America's civil religion and America's more profound values. But it also shows some of the complications in American life. Uh, for example, uh, the very first Washington's birthday was in 1832, and then it became an official American holiday in 1879. Interestingly enough, there is no official, Amer and Washington has a connection to Erie and uh, there's Martha, but interestingly enough, there is no official national holiday for Abraham Lincoln. In fact, in many places, President's Day is not celebrated. And in several states, nine in fact, mostly in the South, but not only, President's Day is still thought of as Washington's birthday. And sometimes it's called President's Day and celebrates Washington and Jefferson or others, which is an interesting little fact. Uh, the first attempt to celebrate Lincoln's birthday nationally was, interestingly enough, in Buffalo, New York. It was organized by Julius Francis, a Buffalo shopkeeper, and he kept it up until his death in 1881. Hannibal Hamlin, Lincoln's first vice president, tried to get a national holiday, didn't succeed. 1951, there was a national commission to create a national holiday, it died in Congress. And so President's Day shows a couple of threads, some conflicting notions about who in fact is an American hero and how they are observed in different places. Doesn't seem to be much ambiguity about Washington, but some about Lincoln. But it also, and of course that's Mary Todd Lincoln, but it also brings up some interesting things. This is a listing of the, the 10 top presidents by Democratic scholars, independent scholars, Republican scholars. I took those, I wanna go back. Uh, we're gonna come back to this slide in a second. Uh, it, but it shows some of the complications of, of how we think about and, and some of the political divisions in our culture, but also, if we go from pagan holidays to Christian holidays to secular holidays, we also then make another step to commercial holidays. We've commercialized Valentine's Day and we commercialized President's Day because President's Day no longer seems to honor Washington or Lincoln. It allegedly honors all presidents, but in allegedly honoring them effectively honors really no one. Um, it's a somewhat of a peeve of mine but it is a great barometer of American commercialism. It is used to sell and sell and sell products. It might come as some surprise to people that the biggest selling product on President's Day is mattresses. And there's all kinds of things we could spin off of that with Valentine's and fertility rituals and ancient pagan rituals. But interestingly enough, the biggest selling item on President's Day, excuse me, our mattresses. So that's a quick look through it. The objects of our common objects, themes of our love. Uh, love comes through all of these holidays, uh, both selfless Christian, unconditional of agape, but undertones of eroticism. Uh, light is a persistent theme uh, in, in ancient cultures and in modern cultures. Light is the light of life. The sign of life is light. And fire has always been although it's a double-edged sword, the symbol of life. Uh, there's whimsy, uh, the cute little girl with the, the cute little comment. And of course, Punxsutawney Phil, Weirton, Phil we Weirton, Willie, Buckeye, Chuck, et cetera. And back to that presidential slide, some of the complications in those top 10 presidents, uh, it's really kind of bipartisan about who is, who is recognized and who is not. 
almost universally, Lincoln in this order, Lincoln, Washington, and Roosevelt are thought to be the three greatest, but frequently you get others. And earlier I was thinking about uh, shifting titles and labels and names uh, don't mean a whole lot, but uh, Lincoln, Reagan, and Teddy Roosevelt were Republicans. Franklin D. and Harry Truman wouldn't be entirely accurate to call Thomas Jefferson a Democrat, but they were Democrats. Washington was a Federalist, which labels are odd. He belonged in a strong central government, so he and Reagan wouldn't have agreed. But in who these people are, you see a lot of the ongoing conflicts in our culture. And of course, the objects of our love, the common themes, as I mentioned, from pagan to Christian to secular to commercial, perhaps back to pagan, uh, the Super Bowl being, uh, we could talk about that. So in any event, that's a quick sprint through February in our American holiday series. Next month, we'll pick up ethnic holidays. A nation of immigrants celebrates its origins. Ben? <laughs> Andy, I want to thank you for that. I know that was a mad dash through uh, several holidays, trying to pack that into one episode. And I think you did that well. And, and I think that that's when we try to look at the takeaway themes in what we're celebrating here in, in February. I, I can't help but be drawn to what you were talking about initially with uh, the profound, uh, the civil religious and, and the, uh, the banal. And I think that maybe this that's is so the funny. moment we that's look at it. Slide if we say the banal is big, because what these all have in common, or at least I'm seeing, is uh, our moment to sort of warm ourselves up or give ourselves uh, some pep, uh, see that light in the middle of winter, or that, you know, winter is now, should be fading, and uh, we're headed towards spring to give us some sort of hope. I, I don't, I, I know we're far removed from our time in the plains in the Serengeti, but, you know, the hair on the back of our neck still stands up when we think the tiger's in the bush. I, I think we're not all that far removed from our agro-based society, that we, we tend to think our calendar through and when we are able to grow food and when we're not able to grow food. And you had mentioned, you know, being able to go outside and pick flowers. We're not exactly picking flowers for Valentine's these days, are we? We're ordering them from a greenhouse, uh, presumably somewhere. You're not going to pick too many flowers in Erie, Pennsylvania today, I don't think. <laughs> not unless you have access to a greenhouse. Right. You and know, as I was thinking about this, um, and as we work our way through this series, uh, I'm coming to the, I, I'm beginning to think that the really important thing for healing some of the fractiousness in our culture obviously is to reassert the profound, the core values, uh, the American civil religion as it's called. But I think in trying to remind Americans what they have in common and what they share uh, and why they're not one another's enemies, in some ways, I come back to popular culture and the banal, because I think those are not uh, flashpoints or, or points of, of, of really nasty contention. You're a Steelers fan. I'm a Browns fan, but that doesn't mean anything. We both like football. Um, but uh, Charles Dickens in uh, David Copperfield with the death of as his young wife Dora is dying makes the comment that life as he's trying to think about their life together their, their uh, the life they shared uh, he begins to realize that the true beauty of it was in the things that seem trifling the common everyday things and um, the great contemporary American poet he just died, well, actually died a couple of years ago. Jack Gilbert had a poem called Highlights and Interstices. Uh, we think of lifetimes as mostly the exceptional and sorrows. Marriage, we remember as the children, vacations and emergencies, the uncommon parts. But the best is often when nothing is happening. The way a mother picks up a child almost without noticing. What if she could keep all? Our lives happen between the memorable. He's talking about his wife. I've lost 2,000 habitual breakfasts with Mishiko. That's his wife who had died. What I miss most about her is that commonplace I can no longer remember. And I think when you think of it that way, that in some ways, the banal, that is American culture. It's not banal, and maybe that's not the best word for it. But I think the common objects of our love is to remember those things and that's actually putting a lot of weight on them because I don't know if a common appreciation for a Big Mac, I don't know if a Big Mac can carry all that sociocultural freight 
Uh, I'm not sure if a baseball game can, but I think if, as, as one looks at all of uh, uh, at these, I think Christmas can. Uh, we'll come back to, I think Valentine's Day can. I think Buckeye Chuck and Punxsutawney Phil can. I, I was just going to jump in. So with that's this. one of the things I think we'll continue to explore. I was going to jump in there, Andy, with it being Groundhog's Day today as, as we're having this conversation. And I can't help but see, uh, so, so in case anybody had missed it, in fact, uh, Puxatani Phil saw uh, his shadow. So we, we have more winter ahead. That's That was the prognostication this morning. I turned to Twitter this morning and I see people just taking it out on this poor groundhog. And I can't help but wonder if the groundhog is actually a scapegoat here. Of we get to channel well, our frustration in the dip depths of winter, we channel it at this groundhog instead of each other. You know, we we direct it at something that we can all, I suppose, support in jest. That we know we yeah. know that a groundhog can't really tell the weather, right? We we do know that. But I, I we, think we can, you're onto something there. I think perhaps back to that ancient Germanic custom of on candle moths. If it was a sunny day and uh, the hedgehog saw his shadow because you now have a scapegoat that can have it either way because if he sees his shadow and we're going to have bad weather yeah you know you know what happens to scapegoats on the other hand if it's uh cloudy and he doesn't see his shadow and we're going to have an early spring you throw him another carrot <laughs> right. You know, and, and if he gets it wrong, there's always next year. You know, we yeah. talked about the fact that he's not terribly accurate, at least ours here in Pennsylvania and the Keystone State's not terribly accurate. Um, uh, but, you know, we still turn to him every year just because he's yeah. not, at, you know, he's inaccurate. We don't support it any less. People still want to plug in and have that experience. And, and I think, you know, I, I agree with you. I don't think one baseball game can bring us all together just as much as I don't think one Super Bowl can bring us all together. But uh, you acknowledged you're a Browns fan. I'm a Steelers fan. We're still both likely going to watch the Super Bowl. And even people right. that don't necessarily watch football now tune in because there's also the halftime show. Um, you know, today's, you know, pop, uh, you know, pop icon the weekend is headlining the halftime show, which doesn't necessarily to me speak football, but here's something that's also happening in that moment. And then the barrage of commercials. There's a reason that advertisers will spend millions upon millions upon millions for the first 30 seconds out of the gate because people are watching. We've gathered around the, the digital hearth to watch something together, even if we're not rooting for our own teams. Exactly. You know, when we get to the sporting thing later, your observation about the, the scapegoat really has struck a chord. I'm going to think about that as we work our way through the holidays. Uh, George Carlin, and I'm sure I can find it on YouTube. In fact, I'm going to look for it on YouTube, did an incredible sketch one or skit uh, when he would compare the love of baseball to the love of football. And I vaguely recall, I'm going to see if I can find it. It's amazing what is out there archived in different places. But I remember reading in Sport Magazine or Sports Illustrated oh, a long time, I mean, a long time ago, a very clever article in which it said part of the appeal of football was that it's kind of like the Romans in the Colosseum. Everybody got their own lions, not the Detroit Lions, but everybody got their own lions and their own Christians. You could root when your team was on offense, they were your Christians and you could root for them. And when your team was on defense, you had your own gladiator. You had it both ways. The beauty of it is you have it both ways. <laughs> well, uh, and I, I, it also shows some of the divides in our culture. It, well, we'll get to that when we get to the sporting episode. <laughs> right. And, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that episode and, and unpacking ethnic holidays, their importance to us as well, and taking a look at, at many others to come. Uh, I, I know we're a bit over here, but I'm so excited for this series. I, I really do think this helps us better learn our American story, the American stories, how we tell our stories of ourselves. Because if, if we saw many things here today, a, a key takeaway I think has to be, Andy, of our adopting of these holiday myths and i say myths as in storytell you know storytelling not untruths but this this mythos and we take it and we make it our own it, the evolution of groundhog's day as a, a germanic custom that uh, somebody thought yeah. hey let's draw attention to punxsutawney how many people had thought about punxsutawney pennsylvania before they created a holiday around a groundhog that was I actually have a better question we're in western how many people well, know anyone from Punxsutawney. I do. <laughs> I I do as well. But, you know, I, aside from the person I know, the first thing I think of is the groundhog. And then I think, think the, the fact groundhog. that 
the entire Pennsylvania lottery you know, system. You make an, ec an excellent point. Uh, I know the phrase melting pot is out of fashion. As a matter of fact, it, it can get a fairly intense reaction uh, from both the right and the left. So maybe I use the word mosaic or something, collage or some other word, but the mosaic, the collage of American culture, you see it in two places, I think. You see it in a lot of places. One, you see it in all these holidays because all of these holidays have, or almost all of these holidays, I should say, have roots or connections in other cultures. And we've just brought them and blended them together and, and made them ours. The other place, is, and of course that can also be in our contentious times, somebody could call it cultural appropriation or whatever, or expropriation, but not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how we've created this, this culture. The other place you see it is in American cuisine. I sometimes think I, I used it in, um, I think maybe in the, the AMTAP episode on QLN and NPR talking about immigration policy. Kelvin Trillin in a New Yorker article some years ago uh, when immigration was also a hot issue said he would base immigration policy on national cuisine. He'd let everybody in except the British. I, I take umbrage with that as my favorite meal is fish and chips. And yeah. I, I feel quite at home with that, but I, like I totally understand. Mash. Totally understand the the concept of it, and I and I do think it's the layering of our stories. And and you know I don't think uh, I don't think at, at least in in our lifetimes here we're going to see a reduction of holidays or a reduction of celebrations. And this becomes a way to begin understanding it. And I think we're taking a wonderful moment here to unpack the history of these holidays and get to learn them better. I'm going to leave it here. Um, ask folks to tune in in the future for future episodes. We're going to broadcast those. We have one coming up that will air on St. Patrick's Day. That's going to be March 17th. So be sure to tune in for that. We're going to cover ethnic holidays in the, um, the story of America, the story of Americans. But Dr. Andrew Roth, scholar in residence at the Jefferson Educational Society, host of the American Tapestry Project on WQLN Public Media with episodes available on the NPR One app and online at wqln.org. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your insights, knowledge, and holiday trivia with us today here. You're welcome, Ben. Thank you. And a big thanks to all of you watching along at home for tuning in. Uh, for more information about upcoming JES digital programming, please do visit jeserie.org. There you're also going to find uh, videos of past presentations available to stream on demand. Other publications that you can tune into, Dr. Roth's book note series uh, being one of those. Uh, you're going to find essays, reports, other timely writings, and uh, much more information coming up on JES uh, future discussions and uh, programming. Then, of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. May your holidays be as merry and bright and informative as they can be, but thank you for listening and learning with us.